Uh, I'm Mark Fleury, and today I'll, I'll be talking about uh, the game I made, Thumper. Um, is there anything else? Yes, please put your cell phones on silent or vibrate, and I'll remind you again about the evaluation forms at the end of the talk. Uh, so thanks for coming, and uh, I am part of a two-person team called Drool. It's myself and Brian Gibson. You might know Brian, he's the uh, bassist for the band Lightning Bolt. He lives in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, <laughs> all right, and he's an artist and musician. And he did all of the art and music for Thumper. Uh, I'm a programmer. I've been living in Korea for the past five years, but I grew up in the United States. And I did all the programming for Thumper. And the game design of, the, of Thumper was a collaboration between uh, the two of us. So if you've never heard of the Thumper, it's a simple action game. You are a space beetle cruising uh, through a dark, psychedelic world at high speed. It's a rhythm game, but our goal was always to make it feel like a unique and intense experience and different than other rhythm action games. We like to call Thumper a rhythm violence game. So if you've never seen it, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with Thumper at all, I'll just play the, the trailer that we released when the game came out. Uh, it's about a minute long. I just have to figure out how to get it on that screen. Let's kind of do a drag. Uh, that's good enough. Thank you, thank you. Oh, um, don't need to see it again. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully that gives you an idea of what the game is like. Uh, so you're controlling that little Space Beetle character. You play the whole game with one analog stick and one button. Uh, so a lot of it involves just beat matching with that one button. As you can see, the little rhythmic cues coming at you. Um, there's also th times where you have to turn, jump, and fly, avoid obstacles, and uh, defeat some bosses. Thumper was released last October on PS4 and uh, PlayStation VR and Steam at the same time. And then a couple months later, I added support, we added support for Steam VR and Oculus. So you can play the whole game either with a VR headset or without. To give you an idea of our background, this is before we started working on Thumper. Um, we started back in 2009. And at that time, Brian already had years of experience working at a game company as an effects artist. But he had never done like all the art for a game before. He'd never art directed a game before. And he ended up doing everything for Thumper. Brian's a very talented musician, but he had never composed electronic music before, never done game audio, never made sound effects for games before. And he did all the audio for Thumper. So for myself, I um, had about six years of professional C++ game programming experience, so I, I kind of knew what I was doing, but most of my experience was limited to things like menus and user interfaces. Actually, very little gameplay programming, very little like serious graphics programming. Uh, like a lot of people, I was kind of pigeonholed at my, at my job, and I did a lot of, of the same thing. Um, I also had a pretty limited understanding of 3D math or graphics. Um, I'd never written a line of shader code before starting Thumper. I didn't really even know what a shader was. So in that sense, I was kind of starting from scratch. And also importantly, like neither Brian and I had never really designed a game before Thumper. Um, 
we'd worked on games and kind of contributed to design discussions, but we were never actually like responsible for designing the whole thing. So back in 2009, uh, we set a set of initial goals for ourselves. Number one was make an engine. And I think this is largely just like a personal goal of mine. I'd you know, come to GDC, I'd been to the experimental gameplay workshop, I'd seen what designer, programmer, kind of hybrid types could do, and I was really impressed by that. And part of me just felt like I'd never be a real game developer unless I made my own engine. Um, I don't think that's true, but this is just what my, how I was, I was thinking about it personally. And um, the other goal was, you know, let's, let's make our own game. Um, I think this is what motivates probably just about everybody who's here at the Independent Game Summit. Uh, you know, we felt that like working at a sort of a corporate game development uh, company, we would never really be able to do what we wanted and realize our artistic goals. And then our goal was, you know, we kept saying like, oh yeah, we'll release it within a year or two. Um, you know, we said that for the first few years of the project. And, um, and this was the last generation of consoles, so we actually imagined Thumper as an Xbox 360 game. Uh, and of course, back in 2009, high quality, like VR was just a fantasy, and we never even dreamed that Thumper would be a VR game. So I, I, I entitled this talk Seven Years in Alpha because uh, we started seven years ago and we set our goals so far beyond our abilities at the time that you know, we, we just you know, got kind of lost along the way many times and it felt like a real adventure. Um, if we really wanted to hit these goals, we should have made you know, a 2D game, um, something much, much simpler and easier to make than Thumper. Um, so it was like cli climbing a personal Mount Everest for us, you know, it was uh, definitely an adventure. And um, before I get into the meat of the talk, I'll just show you what, what it actually took to make Thumper, which was over seven years of development, uh, we built the custom engine, so it's over 100,000 lines of code. Um, we added support for VR, we released simultaneously on Steam and PS4. And we did all that with no external QA. It was just kind of Brian and us, and then with some help from friends at the end. Um, so this talk will mostly be a chronological uh, review of Thumper, uh, the development. I'll talk about key moments where I made some breakthroughs in art, design, and technology behind the game. How, I'll talk about how our understanding of Thumper evolved as we made the game. And I'll also talk about how you know, we changed and how, our, how we look at games changed. Because if you work so long on one project, you know, you're gonna be a different person at the end of it. Uh, finally, I'll say that this is my story of Thumper. Uh, Brian uh, might tell it a little bit differently. So the beginning involves uh, concept art. And um, Brian uh, actually started thinking about making a game and, and coming up with concept art before we even uh, started working together. And with his friend, Matt Brinkman, um, these are, uh, they came up with a lot of concepts about how the game should look. And strong art direction was always a real strength of the project. And you can see from these uh, early sketches, the kind of dark mood and vibe was already set. And um, these are all pencil sketches that Matt Brinkman made. And you can see that he was creating this world out of like these little cubes. Because the, the idea was that it would always be a rhythm game, so it seemed natural to sort of divide the world into these spatialized chunks where each cube represents like one beat or one measure or something like that. Um, and another thing that we determined quite early on was that the character, the main character, should be a beetle. And this was uh, an idea Matt had. In a rhythm game, you want something, we wanted the character to be kind of circular so it's easy to tell where the center point is. Um, it needs to be low to the ground so you can see over it. And we didn't want some generic thing like a spaceship or a car. Um, and I think with those constraints, Matt just immediately just thought, said, oh, it should be a beetle. And that was like one of the first decisions we made in the project. Um, and in, in all of these sketches, like there's so many ideas. Uh, and he came up with these really psychedelic monster ideas, these things that we never used. Um, but are really cool, and what's, what, what I like looking about these now is I think you could make a completely different game with these concepts. Um, and Thumper turned out qu quite a bit different, but it was still uh, really important um, in establishing the, the mood and, and the overall like, art direction of the game. Another big contribution Matt made was the design of the main antagonist of the game. So at the end of every level, there's this giant evil head, and the track that you're moving on like, comes out of his mouth. And that was an idea we had a long time ago. We call him Crackhead. And 
every level he becomes kind of more uh, demented and more disfigured looking, and this is uh, just early sketches that Matt made, and the, cent the central one actually looks a lot like how he looks in the actual game. So I'll move on to like some early uh, prototypes that we made. Um, I, I joined the project in 2009, and uh, Brian hadn't established that much of a game design direction. He had little um, images like this, which were, you know, he kind of imagined Thumper as something where it was like a single track. Instead of a, a bunch of different notes coming at you, there'd just be one stream of notes, but you would be on a grid and you could turn, and that would be kind of the interesting innovation of the game. So you can see here, like, there's kind of a layout where, like, you're following a path and you have to make these right angle turns. He also made this uh, rendering. Let's see if I can play it. It's really short, but I'll play it one more time. So that already kind of established some of the mechanics and kind of the, some of the look of the game, and that's what I kind of used as my target when I wanted to start making, um, well, actually programming. So, like I say, I didn't really know how to do 3D graphics, and the first thing I figured out how to do was draw lines, so all like the early coder art prototypes had this kind of vector style. Um, and even though this is coder art, I think you know, I looked back and I dug up these old prototypes and I also looked back at the emails we were sending each other at this time just to see like what we thought about these because I mean I look at them now and they look quite bad. But what was cool is that we were really enthusiastic. And so I sent this like first prototype to Brian and his reaction, you know, was, you know, yeah, perfect, you know, great job. And, you know, like a month later I figured out how to actually draw quads and to Brian that was like 10 Christmases in a row. Um, and then, you know, I, I figured out how to do texturing, and these don't even have filtering or mip maps, but Brian was just, you know, excited about the fact that there's textures. And then I figured out how to do a skybox and load a model, and, you know, Brian stayed enthusiastic, so. Um, and, you know, I think what's really important about that is if you actually want to make your own engine, like, you're going to, like, most of the steps will not even be that fun, right? You'll do a lot of stuff where there's no visual outward outwardly visible um, result of the work you're doing, so you have to, you better find some way to stay motivated and stay enthusiastic during the whole process. So, uh, neither, we didn't have much tech experience, or programming experience, and we also didn't have much experience as game designers, so, um, you know, we started to ask ourselves like some questions, especially as we got years into this project, which was, is what we're doing actually interesting? And will it be interesting for hours, right? And this is kind of the questions I think everyone asks themselves when they're embarking on a big project. And we didn't really know, um, but we just started experimenting. So I have a few clips of some early prototypes. Um, just bear with me here. Okay. okay. So um, you can see that it was the beat matching mechanic moving on a grid, and you can see like I was doing these weird like double like 90 degree turns just to like kind of show that you could move on a grid. But we didn't really understand like what was cool about moving on a grid or why it was important. But we still thought that that was going to be what kind of differentiated Thumper from other rhythm games. So we actually took it in some really weird directions. Um, here's another movie. So here you have a health, and you have to hit these beats to keep your health from falling to zero. And you have to do these really awkward and difficult loops really fast. Um, yeah, and as you can see, it was really easy to mess up, and it wasn't really clear how. Uh, wish this wouldn't happen. Time. Um, you know, it wasn't really clear, uh, you know, what was going to be interesting about a grid-based rhythm game, but we stuck with it for a long time, and then finally we decided, well, like, it feels the most fun just to go really fast, and, and then we just started to abandon this whole idea of a grid. And here's a later prototype.
So in that one, that one had kind of, you know, the fun, like, rhythm game thing where there's, like, it's really dense and you're getting really in the zone, you can lock in. Um, but it didn't really have the feeling we wanted. Like, it started to just feel like every other rhythm game where it just kind of like, it looks like a UI coming at you, not like you're going through a world, right? It was so dense, the notes are so dense, the turns didn't have any weight or impact to them. Um, and then, you know, and we made another uh, prototype here where it's kind of the same thing, but now we're actually like bending the track and deforming it as you're moving on it. So you'll see some of the turns kind of like appear and then go away. So uh, in that one, we tried to make it more interesting by like bending the track and making you react um, uh, to that as you're playing just simple beat matching gameplay. That also like it turned out to be a dead end and we abandoned it. And we didn't really figure out where we were going until a lot of um, basic polish work happened. Um, and at this point in the project, you know, we knew that the game wasn't that great, and we were showing it to a lot of different designers and you know friends we had that we really respected who had made great games. Um, and a lot of their advice really didn't like match up with what we were trying to do, right? Like we had already gone down this path for for years, and when we Brian and I would talk about the game we were making, we both kind of convinced ourselves that we knew what we were doing, but the game itself didn't communicate these ideas to anyone else. And to get a, you know, we had a better understanding of where we wanted to go, but no clear path to get there. And like, this is the, kind of this experience of being in the wilderness. That's why, you know, um, I feel like we were in this state for a really long time during the project. And it's a state where that can breed a lot of anxiety. Um, and you can feel overwhelmed, but it can also be very exhilarating. Um, as long as you can kind of keep moving forward without the external, without needing external validation and, and trust yourself, then it, it can be a really cool place to be. So around this point in the project in 2011, I moved to Korea, and um, I think that was you know, kind of a challenging time because we would already spent a couple years on this thing. It wasn't very fun yet. <laughs> and we, you know, now that there would be a 14-hour time difference between us, there was um, you know, a real risk of kind of losing momentum. So to switch gears for a second and talk about something a little more technical, like the way we tried to address this was by adding a little feature to our, our uh, editor and our engine. So this is a screenshot of the Thumper editor. Um, there's a bunch of like little editor windows for different types of objects. And the, the one in the upper left is like a browser of all the objects. And this is like the first level in the game and there's like hundreds or thousands of objects in this file. So if I'm working on something and Brian's asleep and I'm like, oh, you didn't set the settings on this material correctly, it would be kind of annoying, you know, to like have to like tell him the name of the material and, and then he'd have to open this file and find it and see what I was talking about. So we added a system where any object in the editor, you can kind of like highlight it or click it, select it and copy a URL, which represents like a unique address of that uh, object. And here, you can see what the URL looks like. The first part, the DRL, is like a custom protocol that you can register with Windows. The second part is the path to that file, and then the, then the last part is the actual name of the object. And uh, how to implement this is detailed on my development blog with the, the link down there, or you can just ask me for it after the talk. But this ended up being super useful, and it was like one of the times when having a custom engine that we could really um, optimize to our own workflow paid off. And we extended it a lot too, where like late in the game, we made it so that you could actually copy URLs at a specific point in a level. And that made it very uh, easy to like say like, oh, there's a bug in like level 2-5 on beat 16, and I could just email Brian a link and would open up the game. He just clicks it in the email, it opens up the editor, and then he's right there looking at it. So to get back to like the design problems that we were working on, um, we didn't really figure out what the game was until we kind of figured out how the turns work. So this is an, a screenshot of one of the last kind of um, grid-based prototypes we made, where you know we found that like when you're going super fast, it's, it just seems physically awkward and weird to like hit a 90 degree turn. So we kind of made the turns you know <laughs> less than 90 degrees, 
And, and then, you know, here we made it um, a little more polished, but it just looks weird, right? There's this weird discontinuity between the rectangular sections. So we were still thinking of everything as these discrete kind of blocks of, of rhythmic time. And Brian, you know, for a long time, Brian kept complaining about how this looked, and he didn't like the, um, <laughs> the way these looked. And, I, and as the programmer, I was kind of like, oh, you're just the, being an artist. You're just worried about polish. Like, let's figure out the real, like, meat of the game. Let's figure out the design problem. And um, I don't really think that way about game development anymore. And you know, this is what it looks like in the finished game, where the turn is this smooth surface. Um, and I'll explain like how we got there. It's really important. Um, and so I'll go step by step. And uh, I remember this very well because I did most of this work when I was on a workcation in Hanoi. Um, if you're a programmer and you ever travel, I recommend you bring an external keyboard and mouse and elevate your laptop to an ergonomic position. It's very important. Um, so here, if you look at this track, uh, so if you think of this like as the path that the beetle moves down, every little square is one beat. And, and then basically, like I figured out how we could deform the meshes so that they seamlessly matched up. Um, it seems pretty simple when I do this, but for me it was like a couple of weeks of work figuring out how to do that. Um, in a vertex shader, I calculate a rotation matrix for every single vertex and rotate it around one axis, right? Um, and then I make, it sure, make sure that it's seamless and it matches the next uh, mesh perfectly. Um, we also added this ability to make it so we could dynamically scale the meshes before deforming them. So here you can see I've uh, uh, made this, the path thinner, and then here I can also extend the path. So if each block is still the same amount of musical time, we can scale the path and make the beetle go faster and slower really easily. Um, and everything's still seamless. We also made it so that you could pitch the path up, and you could also add a twist. So it's all three you know, axes of rotation that you can apply. Another really important thing is figuring out how to um, properly deform the normal vectors on these meshes so that the lighting looks good. So you can see that the lighting's all smooth. Um, there's no weird discontinuities. And this is extra important because a big part of Thumper's visual look are reflection maps. And these are just simple cube maps calculated from you know, the eye position and a, in a normal vector. But with the normal vector properly um, deformed, then the reflections look really nice. And in order for this to work, we had to really highly tessellate the meshes um, so that they look pretty smoothly. So like Thumper spends a lot of time every frame just deforming vertices in a pixel shader in a way that's probably not, I mean, in a vertex shader, in a way that's probably not very efficient. But you know, a lot of, I think games end up spending a lot of time doing other things like have, they have real lighting or more complicated rendering or they just draw a lot of stuff. Thumper doesn't draw a lot of stuff and we just spend the time on this. Um, so, you know, once this kind of came together, uh, and here's the final image again, you can see that the, it's, a, it's like a seamless, smooth um, curve. There's a reflection map on it that has kind of a really nice, iconic look. Um, and it, it seems like something that you could like hit really fast and then kind of continue going. And, you know, beat matching was kind of the, the first kind of core mechanic we settled on, but I think turns and the feeling of the turns and thumper are what really make it feel good and what make the game actually fun to play. And I think like most action games, there's always kind of one, you know, fundamental interaction that you play the game hours and hours for. Like in a hockey game, it might be like checking the dude or, um, I don't know, shooting someone in the head, stuff like that. Um, and uh, you can also see that the track is, is sloped up. Uh, and this was another advantage of this kind of dynamic system where basically the whole time you're playing Thumper, you're moving up until where you're actually doing like a giant circle through space. But that helps you see all the obstacles a lot clearer. And it's not something that most people notice, but it's actually really important. Um, so we uh, use the same technology in so many ways. And it's a real credit to Brian's kind of artistic vision that you know, something that was designed just to fix this one little visual discontinuity became like the fundamental visual tool that he used to make the whole game. And um, so this is what the checkpoint looks like. And I just want to show an animated version of this. Let's see. Right, so you can see these are the checkpoints you go through in the game. And it's using the same vertex shader, except we're applying a scale over the length of it, so it gets like you know down to a little fine point at the bottom, um, and then Brian also realized that you know rather than just 
like deforming these simple little uh, squares, we could make more interesting meshes. So this is a segment of something we call the zillipede. And this thing was something we spent <laughs> like way too much time on for its actual impact on the game. But basically here we're now like, you know, modulating colors and scale and width of a whole sequence of, of, of instance meshes. Um, and it creates this kind of like evil looking worm and it's all, um, and the path that the worm is following is actually another sequence and he's just kind of being phased along it to animate him. And you can see that here in this video that um, it's actually just like a, an animation in the editor. You can like scrub the whole thing back and forth. And like, yeah, we probably spent like a couple weeks just making that possible. <laughs> um, and then ultimately uh, it showed up in the game it just kind of as a background element in one of the boss battles. Um, but, you know, we, we also did a bunch of other experiments with this, this vertex shader. We created a lot of different creatures and I really wish we would have found a way to put this guy in the game, but he got cut. Um, and so here, like, these are just some screenshots from the game where the decorative tentacles you see on the side are that same vertex shader being animated. Um, this boss and the, and the obstacles you have to jump over, the same stuff. Uh, the, it was also really important for making the tunnels that you go through because the tunnels are all seamless and they're reflective and it's the same thing where now the, the mesh that we're deforming is just like a, a cylinder that you're going in the middle of and we just sequence it. And then Brian, like, you know, just did all kinds of stuff with it, like this, here's a, a boss character, this kind of spiral graph starfish, where it's the same thing, but now like he's kind of using it as like a weird particle system um, with this ra radial sy symmetry. So, um, you know, Thumper is a music game. I should t say something about the audio, although I think it's unique in that it was a music game that found itself through like visual experimentation. And um, Brian uh, did all of the audio, um, himself and he changed like what the game sounded like so many different times. There were a lot of different musical influences and the way we approached it was always by like making the gameplay first in the visuals and kind of just adapting the audio to fit that, kind of the reverse of how I think a lot of other music games are made. Um, I just also want to mention that I used FMOD as the only middleware in the whole engine and, and it was great. It's very indie friendly pricing and they have awesome support so I just want to say that I recommend FMOD. And um, this is, uh, this is, uh, let's see if I can get this pointer up here. So this is uh, how we actually author gameplay. And it looks a lot like a step sequencer where, you know, up top here, he's placing things like um, the beats you have to hit, the turns in the track. He's making an upward slope along the whole thing. And then down here, he's triggering little samples that go along with the audio. And I think that this tool is really fundamental. Um, we call it like the sequence editor. And it was really fundamental in how we made um, the game. And you know, when I first started working on building the engine and tools, like I kind of was, you know, the only thing I knew was like the engine I used at my old job or, or Unity. And I was kind of trying to recreate those tools and make really general purpose stuff. And I found that like it was always got the best results when I made something really specific for our game, something that really, like a tool that could do one thing really, really well. And that was a lesson I learned uh, along the way. So um, in 2004, you know, we, we um, I've been working on the game for a long time. And I think because we had the turns working and the game felt really well, we felt confident, confident enough now to submit it to uh, things like the IGF. And it got a nomination for excellence in audio. Um, and I went back and listened to that build that we submitted and it sounds terrible, like really bad. Like, uh, like the mastering is off, there's a lot of distortion. And I really think that uh, it was the visual elements and the funness of the game that convinced people to, to nominate it for audio. Just the fact that it's a music game kind of makes you eligible for that category. So I think that's why we got that. Um, and that was really cool. This was uh, us two years ago in the IGF. Um, and I think the best thing we got out of that was just meeting other game developers who were interested in our game and that was super motivating um, to continue and finish the game. Um, so I'm gonna go and talk about one more uh, really important visual element of the game, which are the post-processing effects we use. Um, and again, this was something that I just considered polish and like Brian kept 
you know, bothering me about wanting to use post-processing effects and our engine didn't support it and I thought it was something we didn't have to worry about right away. Um, but like to say something really obvious, like everything in your game needs to be interesting or your game needs to be interesting and how you achieve that doesn't really matter. Um, I think certain games like Tetris would be interesting if you, you know, with no visual polish, but Thumber is a game that is all about visual polish. And um, yeah, all that matters is the, the final result. Um, and so another thing Brian said was that, you know, like when you think about visual effects, post-processing effects are something that affect every single pixel on the screen. So in that sense, they might be the most important effect you have. So here's the, an image of Thumper fully post-processed. This is from the final game. And this is it without any of the post-processing effects. I mean, it, maybe it looks kind of cool, but for me it lacks like, you know, all the dynamic elements, all the mood, all the tone that this image has. So I just want to go step by step and show what we did. And all of these are really easy to implement. They just took a long time to kind of tune. So um, first we, we apply a bloom a very standard effect, and then we desaturate the scene, leaving the bloom fully saturated. Then we apply a cubic distortion filter over the whole scene, which really distorts quite a bit. And it's really important for selling the sense of speed in the game. And you can see that it really distorts the player character a lot. Um, he gets way longer. And nobody really knows that he's being distorted because he never really moves from that position on the screen. And we kind of like the way he looks longer like that, so it didn't bother us. Um, and then we apply like a levels over the whole scene and this is just like basically modeled on the Photoshop like RGB output, um, black white output value filter. Um, and this was something that Brian just wanted and he, this is the one that changes the most when you play the game and it really helps like make different parts of the game have a different mood or feel. And we apply a radial blur over the whole screen. Um, this also helps with the sense of speed. And then we apply a vignette, um, which is another generic effect, but this kind of um, makes uh, the, it keeps the stuff in the periphery, let, it makes it less distracting, and it also brightens the center of it. We use the overlay blend mode to bright the center of the center point of the screen. Like there's no real lighting in Thumper, so this kind of is like a fake, <laughs> like HDR or something. Um, and then last but not least, we apply another vignette, which we call the noise vignette. And this, you can see it here, it only affects the skybox. And it brightens the skybox, darkens the edges of the skybox, and then it applies this high frequency noise and it's, you have to kind of see it animated and look really closely, but there's a noise texture being played on the background. This helps the foreground elements pop more. Um, also, like, I don't understand color space theory yet. That's something I'm gonna work on for the next game. So there's some pretty bad banding artifacts in Thumper because we're doing everything in linear color space and this, this noise kind of helps mask some of that. So it's important. Um, so to summarize the essential visual effects of Thumper, we use this vertex bend shader to create the smooth surfaces. Uh, we use tons of reflection maps on everything. Um, and we use uh, like a really highly tuned post-processing effects. What we don't have are um, any complex lighting. Like we support diffuse and specular, but really don't use it almost anywhere. Um, no normal maps, no real particle systems. Anything that looks like a particle was just some big hack that Brian did. Um, and, and the nice thing about that is, you know, I didn't have to program all of this stuff, and this was the, the, like a real benefit of having this kind of minimal aesthetic and working with a really talented artist like Brian. So I think at this point, once we really had um, the visual look of the game, that really built our confidence. And now when we showed the game, like people would play 10 minutes of it and they would get excited. Well, most people would. And, and I think, you know, for me, confidence as a game designer means just like being able to stick to your guns, right? Like you have a bunch of stuff that you don't understand yet or you don't know what you're gonna do and just um, feel like eventually you'll figure it out. And I think that's what having the post-processing effects and all the visual elements uh, gave us with Thumper. Um, so I'm gonna make a little segue and then like I also gained some confidence as a programmer. And what's really interesting is that I'm a much different programmer and the way I approach programming is different. Um, Specific, well, one big thing is I don't um, use object-oriented programming anymore. Um, and when I was starting Thumper, it was really the default way I thought about stuff. Like my brain, like the gears wouldn't start turning unless I like started typing out a class definition, um, right? Or started like thinking about object interaction diagrams and it was how everyone programmed at my old job and that's what I thought real programmers did. Um, and I don't want to get into like an argument about this or something, but um, it's just interesting to me that I change that much. And you know, when you work on something for a long time, you do change. 
And if you're interested in this, this is a talk by Brian Will on YouTube that I recommend uh, you check out. Um, and now what I think good code is, is much different. So um, I have a file called avatar.cpp. It's about 5,000 lines of code and almost 90% of the gameplay and input handling and a lot of the complicated stuff that makes Thumper fun to play is in this one file. Um, it's all done in a procedural uh, programming style. Um, and you know, this is also the fact, you know, when you're on an indie game, when you're making an indie game or when you're working by yourself, you should probably not program the same way as you do on a big team if you want to be more efficient. Um, another example is all the rendering code is in one giant file. It supports all these different rendering backends and probably some new ones soon. And that's, you know, 90% of the graphics code is in this one file. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we brought Thumper to VR. So, uh, like I said, we never imagined that Thumper would be a VR game, and my first experiences with VR um, were very negative. I think I used an Oculus DK1, and I did like a roller coaster and skydiving demo, and it just made me sick. And, you know, most people who saw Thumper just thought it would make them very sick if they tried to play it in VR. And, um, but, you know, we were very aware of all the hype and the marketing opportunities around VR, and... Uh, I ended up going to GDC China, and I attended this talk. Um, I think he also gave it at GDC Europe, if you want to check it out. And I thought it was very interesting. He talked about a lot of the physiological causes of motion sickness, and in particular with um, uh, VR experiences, what makes a lot of people sick are changes in acceleration, right? Like when you're uh, moving or, or speeding up or slowing down, and you know, your body doesn't have that same feedback, and it creates vexion and leads to motion sickness. So I um, realized that in Thumper, you're going super fast all the time, but you're going at a constant speed most of the time, especially because it's a rhythm game. And when you're going through the turns, they're so fast that they just kind of feel like teleportations. You don't really feel like you're um, actually turning for any extended period of time. So um, we got Sony to send us a PSVR kit, and we just decided to try um, to put, bring Thumper to VR. And um, this is uh, my home office in Seoul, and this is one of the few times in the past like five years where Brian and I actually got to work in the same physical space. He came to Korea for like three days, and um, we basically didn't leave this room for those three days, and we figured out almost all of the fundamental issues bringing Thumper to VR during that time. So uh, one of the first challenges was how does Thumper work um, with a different field of view. Because when you have a 2D game, of course, you can set the camera field of view to whatever you want. And in 2D, we have a super wide field of view, and that really helps things feel deeper, and it's essential to the sense of speed in the game. In VR, um, the field of view is, a, is constrained by the lens in the VR headset. If you don't know how it works, like basically you have to use the same um, FOV as the lens, otherwise things are gonna look like wrong or broken. So here in VR, like, uh, it's about 100 degrees in PSVR, and everything looks way closer to you. And when we played the game like this, it just felt kind of slow and not exciting. Um, and so this seemed like a really hard problem to solve, but Brian like, instantly knew what to do, and that was just to basically scale the, the path by two times and, and just scale everything further away from you. So you, in VR, you're actually going twice as fast as you are in non-VR, and it seems like that would be insane, but it feels like you're going basically the same speed. So to compensate for the FOV, we just push everything further out. And this is something that <laughs> works for Thumper, but might not work for a lot of games. Um, another big question was, uh, you know, how big are you in the world of Thumper when you put on the headset? Like, if you look at this image, like there's a space beetle and all this abstract stuff, there's no real world um, uh, analog to these things. So originally we had it where the beetle was this big thing and you were this little tiny guy, um, like he's like this big spaceship or something. And in this sense, you felt really um, detached um, and distant. So of course we did the opposite where um, we made it so the beetle's about the size of your head. And this felt like, you're, you know, like you were just like flying head first down this like hell ride. Um, and it was really intense, like too intense. It felt like you're getting smacked in the face. Um, and it was almost a little nauseating. Um, and we found that the sweet spot was to be about where the beetle's sh uh, about shoulder width, about 40 centimeters. Um, and this felt like you were sliding down the track, kind of like a slip and slide or like a playground. And this was really the sweet spot of intensity and comfort. Um, and so I, I saw that, um, you know, the famous game designer, Jeff Minter, who I've never met, but I saw that he was developing a PSVR game. So I sent him a build of Thumper. And then the next day he tweeted this. Um, 
And so I think this means that we got the scale correct because he really feels like he was, you know, immersed in there. Um, I guess he never men mentions Thumper in this tweet, so maybe this is just the way he lives his life. I, like I say, I, I don't know him. But, um, anyway, and then another cool thing we could do in VR was uh, adjust the scale of the bosses. So in, this is Crackhead in level one, and you see that's about as big as he can be before he starts like, going off the screen. Um, but in VR, we just make him four times bigger. Um, and that means that like, you have to kind of look up to see him, and he's like looming and more ominous. So that was a nice thing about the VR uh, experience we could do. Um, so the stuff with all the VR, like the fact that it worked out was kind of this like, incredibly fortunate um, and lucky thing. Like We kind of chased the technology, right? We're like, oh, we've got a game. It's almost done. Here's this big marketing opportunity. Let's bring it to VR. And it worked out, but I, I don't know that that would work out most of the time. And, um, you know, like I say, most of what we did was really specific to Thumper. Um, and I don't know that it's applicable to other VR games. I think that the big kind of takeaway here might be that, you know, when there's a new technology, no one really knows what will make it interesting or successful. Like the engineers or the business people behind it have some ideas for sure, but it's always kind of up to artists to like use it in new and unexpected ways. Um, so in the last part of the talk, I want to kind of just talk about what it took to get Thumper over the finish line. So the last six months of the project, you know, we decided we we're going to be a PSVR launch title. And that was the first time in the whole project we had a hard deadline. And it was a really brutal experience. But um, the first thing we had to get through was optimization, right? So the game was running on PS4, was our main target platform, um, at... Uh, about 60 frames per second, kind of bouncing off 60 frames per second, right? And then with PSVR, like now we're rendering the scene twice, we're doing super sampling um, to make it look better, and we're rendering at 90 frames per second. So that's almost three times as many, you know, pixels per second. Um, and if you tried to do this, I think, like raise the bar like this at the AAA scale, like you just couldn't do it, right? Because I mean, you probably have experienced engineers who made a bunch of decisions about how art assets should be built, and you had tons of content all built to those specifications. Um, and if you did this with like a commercial engine like Unity, I think it's really easy to paint yourself into a corner where you know, you've know you made it the whole game with one level of performance and you don't have any ability to get really deep and, and uh, tinker or you don't have full control over the way your data is used and, and ultimately you know, displayed on the screen. So um, what, what, you know, I think our advantage was that we had a custom engine and that I'm not an experienced graphics programmer. So I was kind of banking that I'd done a bunch of stupid stuff that we could find and, and improve upon. Um, and we had a lot of help too. I mean, Sony was very useful. Like I met with Sony engineers and they helped me better understand the PS4. So actually getting, the G, getting GPU performance um, to spec was not that hard. Um, we did the thing where you draw, um, both eyes at the same time, like if there's a cube in both eyes, you draw that cube for the left eye and then immediately for the right eye. It's kind of called multi-slice rendering. All the major VR headsets um, recommend you kind of render this way. Um, also, because of this vertex shader, um, I was already using tons of hardware instancing where like, you know, we're, draw we're drawing one mesh many, many times, so you only send that mesh to the GPU once and then you apply different uh, parameters to it. Um, using a shader, um, and that was a big win for Thumper. And then we did a few like specific things for the PS4, but not that much. Um, kind of the biggest thing I had to tackle was CPU optimization. Um, I mean, Thumper all runs on one thread on the PS4, so like I, you know, I didn't have time to build a multi-threaded you know, engine, so it was really just about getting that one thread to be fast enough, um, where basically everything happens, and, and most of that, um, as is often the case, had to do with memory access and allocation. Um, so I just want to explain what I did there with Thumper, and it's a pretty simple thing that worked. Um, and it was heavily inspired by this um, blog post by Nicholas Gray. Uh, and this whole um, blog that he has, um, it used to be called the BitSquid engine, but now it's called the Autodesk engine. And if you're interested in building your own engine, I think this is a great resource to start. Um, so the main uh, thing I do is I, I use custom allocators everywhere. Um, and so that means like I override operator new like this. So you can't use operator new. It forces uh, like kind of a higher level of discipline over all the code where all the code uses a custom allocator and then that kind of forces you to think about how is the memory being used and um, is it being used efficiently. I also require that all uh, memory I allocate is deallocated. So 
in the like destructor of the allocators, including when the program shuts down, they will assert. Uh, and this is a really good way to just find memory leaks right away. And I didn't have to build like any sophisticated memory tracking tools or debugging tools. This was sufficient. And the reason is is because Thumper's allocation um, pattern is quite simple. When the game starts up, I just malloc a massive chunk of memory. I take advantage of the fact that like you know the PS4 has what like eight gigabytes of memory, and that's not close to how much Thumper needs to run, or probably most indie games need to run. And then so to start divvying up this big chunk of memory, I use a stack allocator. So when you see like the Drool logo, like I'm basically loading you know over half the game during those like 10 seconds. Um, and it's a stack allocator, which is super easy to implement. And then I uh, allocate a bunch of little uh, utility allocators for certain things that are necessary while the game's running, like effects and animations. Those are almost all pool allocators, and there's a couple other ones. Um, and then when I load a level, I allocate from the other side of the stack. So it's a double-ended stack allocator, still really easy to implement. And then when the level is unloaded, it goes away, and I can load a new level. So I can do everything with this one big chunk of memory, and it um, avoids fragmentation problems. And I just have this, these are, I only use four types of allocators, the big stack one, the pool, scratch, and frame. And these are all really easy to implement. I won't go into them. And um, I think the thing I just want to mention is that I think there's a kind of, a, when, it, when I was learning programming, there was this kind of attitude that you know, memory management is super hard and it's really you know, dangerous, like you're gonna be spending all your time chasing down memory leaks and stuff, and that's not the case, I don't think, and it's sad that um, it's not taught in, in a way like this. Like once I read this, that, that blog post by Nicholas, I just like, a light went on, and I was like, oh yeah, that's how you should use C++, and that's how you should manage your memory. And, um, and you know, if you think that using like a garbage collected language or using something like Unity is saving you a lot of time, like it might not actually be true. Um, and another big advantage of optimization, or the, the, of art direction with regards to optimization is that Brian was like totally into this minimal aesthetic. And if you look at the game, almost um, all the scenes in the game are, you know, there's one or two key visual elements, like there's like the boss or the tentacles or a tunnel. We never do all of them at once. Um, and that, that kind of you know, lowered the, the, the bar for what I had to deliver as the programmer. Um, and you know, Brian was really good about defending what was really critical about the look. And, but also he was really good about cutting the fat too. So we didn't really have to sacrifice much visual quality to get the game running in VR. And a nice side effect was that with PS4 Pro, um, we can render in native 4K because we had, we had done so much optimization. So um, if you look at, it's easier to see on this chart, like that's, you know, native 4K at 60 frames per second is about 500 million pixels per second which is more, but the PS4 Pro has a GPU that's about twice as powerful, so it was well within what we could do. Um, and then we also were able to enhance the quality on uh, PSVR if you're running on PS4 Pro. So, um, you know, during this whole, like, optimization and bug fixing period, like, we were still, like, play testing the game, and, like, we were still really just, like, everything was coming in super hot, and I know that we had, we had this 10 minute demo that we showed many times that people really um, liked, but there was the whole rest of the game. Like, you know, it's like a 10 hour game and how, you know, whether or not that, that whole thing's gonna hold up and be fun and be understandable for everyone is something, a question that we didn't answer until really late. And I think it was um, because of these people, um, especially that we were able to do it. These are all people that, you know, I sent builds and like donated their, their time um, just because they were excited about the game. And it was every, everything from just people like, you know, telling me that the game didn't run on their machine to, um, you know, people who played the game for hours and hours and became experts and helped us add new, like, expert mechanics. Um, so we're really grateful for that. And like I mentioned earlier how, you know, th there's this, this feeling that, like, no one could help us, right, like, when we're in the wilderness. But at the end of the project, these people saved us. And, like, having, like, a community of other indie developers, I think, is one of the most, you know, valuable things you can have. Um, so, like I said, we had no external QA, and I think the way that we got away with that was that, well, it's a pretty simple game, but we also did tons and tons of game shows. Um, it stopped being fun after a while, but we did so many of these um, that like the, the build was constantly being tested. We were constantly finding usability and technical issues. It was running on all this different hardware. Um, we also took advantage of the Sony kiosk demo program where I made three different kiosk demos 
over the last year of the project, um, and those all require a certification pass, so I, could, I got some experience doing that. Um, we were also on the PSVR demo disc, which was another certification pass, and um, it was a lot of extra work, but it ended up being worth it. And then Sony also offered VR consultations where we would send them builds and they would just point out um, issues with the way we were doing VR. Um, so that was really useful. Um, I also want to just mention a couple partners that helped us get over the finish line. Like we did everything um, from the business side and the marketing side ourselves. And it was really hard for us to trust anyone. Um, I mean, I don't know, I'm the kind of person that made my own engine, so maybe that explains it. But, um, you know, like to release a, on a PS4 in Japan, which we did at the same time as everything else, um, Zach from Kakahashi Games was really helpful. Um, and he, um, his business model, I think, is what a lot of indie developers are looking for. Um, and I would recommend working for him if you want to bring a console game to Japan. And also, uh, Chris Dwyer is a um, indie marketing specialist. Um, he's kind of like a one-man company, and he actually reached out to us and helped us with marketing and, and press outreach during the last month of the project when I was the most stressed out. And he was really a lifesaver, and I think the nice, nicest thing I can say about Chris is that uh, during that month, he really felt like part of the team, and I really trusted him. So um, I think he you know, doesn't have that much free time because he's just a one-man company, but I also highly recommend Chris. Uh, so the game came out, um, and you know it was a very weird experience, like this you know thing that you'd worked on for so long, and suddenly it's out, it's done. Um, I'm still kind of processing how I feel about it, but um, the, more than any review score or anything, this um, user from NeoGaf uh, posted this image, and I think this alone made it all worthwhile. So, I mean, I think this kind of summarized a lot of our goals uh, with Thumper, and it's cool to see stuff like this. Um, but of course, you know, we weren't actually finished. Um, there's, you know, an immense pressure to sustain and maximize, um, you know, after so much work. Um, we immediately started working on Vive and Oculus support. We added, like, a new gameplay mode called Play Plus Mode. We did support bugs, customer service, stuff everyone has to do, and I'm still working on stuff. So it's really been, even though it came back in, out in October, it's really been a full-time job uh, since then. And uh, so, yeah, you know, if you want to go, go, go on your own and make your own engine, that's kind of, you know, what you're getting yourself into. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I have a, just maybe one more unrehearsed comment <laughs> about the whole project. And, um, you know, I think when I, I, what I would remember most fondly about the whole project is not like the kind of external validation or the review scores or the sales or anything like that. It was that feeling of being in the wilderness with Brian and, um, you know, uh, having that freedom and that privilege to be able to like, you know, just get totally lost and like not be conscious of, you know, what other people are going to think about the, uh, about the game or feel about my position in the industry or anything like that. And, um, that's a privilege that you know not enough people get, and I think it's something that has to come from, you know, an industry uh, or society that makes that an important thing. It's like kind of like going to university or education, right? Or getting an education. You can't do that on your own. It takes a, a community of people. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank everyone who helped us along the way. Thank my wife, who I couldn't have done it without. Um, so that's the end of the talk. And um, we have some time for Q&A, and this is my email address if you want to um, message me after that. Thanks. Um, if there's any questions, there's some aisle microphones. Um, I recommend you use those. So I have uh, two related questions. It's basically, how were you full time all seven years, and how did you fund the project? Contract work or funding or? Um, okay, yeah, I was full time the last out of the seven years. The first two years, I had a day job working at a game developer, and I made it work on Thumper only, like nights and weekends. The next five years, I was full time. Um, you know, so that included programming, marketing, biz dev, all that stuff. And funding was mostly savings from my job that I worked for six years and the support of my wife, whose job um, in Korea came with a housing stipend and helped me have a low cost of living. So that's how I did it. 
Um, so both the, uh, the look and also some of your implementation notes about Thumper kind of remind me of the early 90s demo scene of massively optimizing graphics and tiny little packages. Was that an influence on y'all at all? Uh, I don't think it was a direct influence, um, although we like, like that stuff. I mean, I think a lot of it's interesting. I think like some of the things we talked about were like we wanted it to be really psychedelic, but we didn't want it to be like light feeling or kind of wishy-washy. We wanted like hard psych, you know, like we wanted, um, and it, kind of like 2001, right? Like the monolith, like that image is like so simple and stripped down, but it's like terrifying. Um, so I think, yeah, the, yeah, there were so many influences more than I can uh, mention, but that, that was a big one. All right. Um did you satisfy your curiosity of uh, building your own engine? And um, second question would be, um, would you use a commercial engine knowing all the job that you need to do to actually have an engine? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it satisfied a lot of my curiosity. And, you know, I did have to always remind myself that, like, I don't want to make engines for my life. You know, I don't want that to be my goal. I, my goal is to make games. And um, um, so sometimes I felt like I went down this weird rabbit hole that wasn't necessary. but. Ultimately, yeah, it was worth it, um, and I wouldn't. I don't think I could ever stand using a commercial engine now because, like, even if it does 99% of what I want to do, the last 1% is really important to me. So, yeah. Does this one work? I was wondering, um, I saw how you created the tracks uh, with pieces being put together, but uh, in the game, uh, does your character, does the beetle move in world space, or does the track move uh, around your center point when, it's, uh, when, you're, when you're moving? Uh, the camera and the beetle mo are actually moving through space. Um, okay, so there's actually a track out there that's being built, and it's moving along. Yeah, yeah, it's being built out like 50 beats ahead of you, and... Um, I mean, at one point we had it so that we could like animate everything, every frame, but we kind of dialed some of that back just for performance reasons, but yeah. Cool, looks great. Um, also, I made an observation that uh, back when you had the 90 degree turns and uh, it's kind of like on a grid and you're picking up balls, it reminded me of the bonus stages in Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Oh yeah, so okay, If you cool. want to see like a shipped version of that, uh, check that out. Okay, cool, <laughs> thanks. So I fully intend to watch the uh, YouTube video you uh, referred to, but can you summarize in a nutshell what's wrong with object-oriented programming? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not disagreeing. No, I'm curious. No, sure. I mean, well, this is just, this is just me, and um, I don't want to go too long on this, but yeah, I think that, um, like that video says, like object-oriented programming has this goal of encapsulating things um, as a way to make um, problems easier to solve. And I think that it forces you to do encapsulation like all the time, including really early on. And the reality of how at least I program is that you know first I just kind of want to get see something working, and um, I want to um, then like you know maybe then make it more beautiful or make it more performant or something. And I just found that object-oriented programming just creates this meta problem that I'm spending all my time solving and not actually solving the actual problem I want to solve. I also find it much easier to think of things often as data and and, and um, functions and data as separate things, um, especially when like you, your goal is, as a game programmer is to transform tons of data at once, and trying to fit, fit something into an object-oriented programming model is not, for me, a very useful um, tool. Um, that's basically it, yeah. Hey, so when you were making music for Thumper, uh, was the music more informing level design or was it the other way around? Like, did you start first with the track that you wanted to make and then build the level around it? Or was it more like you started with what you want to do with the level and then sort of added the music to that? Well, yeah, Brian made all the music, but basically, um, I mean, it was so iterative that like, you know, we were constantly changing the levels, constantly trying new music. So there's so much experimentation and back and forth, but Broadly, the, the overall goal was to like kind of make a fun action game and then add music that accompanied that. So we never like I mean, there's a soundtrack for Thumper and some people enjoy it and that's cool. But like the, the goal was never to make like songs that would be catchy or memorable. It was more about to make like a game experience that that used sound. Yep. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, did you ever come close to quitting? 
Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, and like I said, that's like a very privileged thing to say. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I do what I want whenever I want. You know, like, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't really give up because um, it was always something that was interesting. And certainly, like, during the seven years that we were working on it, I, um, there's, you know, you get burned out. And you do have to, like, start thinking about, like, um, your own, like, psychological well-being. And like I say, like, there were parts of, like, where the uncertainty, anxiety were kind of paralyzing. And certainly towards the end of the project, like when I think about how hard it was and how like kind of dehumanizing and brutal the act of commercializing the game was, like there's certainly things that like I hope I never do again or like, you know, I kind of got making a game all by myself out of my system and I don't know that I want to do it the same way again. I just wanted to ask, how did you do difficulty tuning? Because I'm terrible at the game, I love it, but. <laughs> How did we do difficulty tuning? Like, I guess it was mostly just observing people and, um, you know, over, like we kept making the game easier basically because obviously we were like total experts and we had no concept of, of how hard the game was um, by the end of it. And um, so, you know, we did all these game shows where we would watch people and then we just, you know, tried to make sure that like 95% of people at least could beat the first level or get through most of the first level. And I think there's also like, Thumper's not that hard a game. Um, well, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but it's, it's not that punishing, right? Like you'll die and then you just go back to the previous checkpoint and you get to practice the same thing you just did. And I think there's just something about rhythm games that are particularly frustrating. Um, you know, you know what you have to do, but you just can't do it. And so that's why I think a lot of people I think it's a hard game. Hey, thanks. I was wondering um, how you dealt with cross-platform problems since you just used FMOD as your only middleware? Oh yeah, um, so right, FMOD's awesome because it worked out of the box and that was like something that just worked across everything. But for cross-platform stuff, um, right, like so I, I first I wrote in uh, this really bad renderer in DX9 and that's what I was using for a long time. And then once I had to port to PS4, like that port took a long time mostly because I had to kind of make the engine cross-platform. I had to build that level of indirection or abstraction into the engine. Um, and I think that was another instance where like, like naively I was like kind of anticipating this from an object oriented perspective where I was like, oh, I'll make like a mesh and then I'll have like a DX subclass of that mesh or do the same thing with materials. And that's just threw all that, that garbage out and, and started just basically doing procedural programming and, and slowly refactoring things out. Um, I don't know, um, nothing's that special. Like I think every time I've added like a new rendering backend, the, the, the code's gotten better because I just kind of understand um, things better, so, yeah. Can I follow up? Um, did you have a lot of support problems with different graphics cards on PC and stuff? Yeah, I mean, still dealing with them. And it's always hard to know like, um, you know, I mean, do Uni I don't know, do Unity games have all these problems? I don't know, maybe it's just my game because it's a custom engine, but um, yeah, we kind of work through them. And like I say, like customer service is actually a really important skill if you're gonna make a custom engine because you've got to convince people to trust that you're actually gonna fix it and like send you a system report. And, and especially with the VR stuff, it's still kind of like the Wild West and like there's so much, so many different configurations. And um, I think, you know, for 99% of people it works, so that's pretty acceptable. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. If there are no more questions, then that might be the end of the talk. Okay, thanks. <laughs>